Hey guys, in this video I'm going to present a solution to Romanian Masters of Mathematics Shortlist 2018 problem C3. This problem is concerned with characterizing the tournaments where you can read off the outcomes of all games based on just the final score sheet. More precisely, we consider a tournament T where n players play against every other player exactly once. They receive two points for each win, one point for a draw, and of course zero if they lose. And the question is, what is the number, f of n, so in terms of the total number of players, of score sequences ordered um, in decreasing order, a1, a2, up to an, that determine t uniquely. We mean by that, that knowing the score sequence a, together with the knowledge of which player got which score, we can tell the outcome of every single game. Now let's consider a good tournament T and try to figure out some properties about it. The main observation is that if we have two small tournaments, T1 and T2, that are distinct but have the same score sequence, then T can't contain either of them as a sub-tournament. One example that illustrates this approach and is also very powerful in itself is the cycle. Namely, if we have a cycle of draws, then within that cycle any player will receive exactly two points, which is the same score sheet we would obtain if we had a cycle of wins. In order to write this down, let's introduce some notation. And we will write P wins against Q in this way. And moreover, if P and Q draw, then we write P draws Q like this. Let me write down what I just said. So we consider some players. Let's call them Q1 q2 up to q little n and uh, we assume that qi always draws against uh, qi plus one then within the sub tournament all players receive exactly two points now if our players q1 q2 all the way up to qn form a directed cycle in other words we assume that qi always wins against qi plus one, then we are going to have the same score sequence where each player receives precisely two points within this sub-tournament. So if we denote this cycle by cn and the directed one with dn, then all of this tells us that if we have a good tournament t, then t doesn't contain a dn or cn for n greater than or equal to three. Now we need to show a quick lemma that will be quite intuitive once you have seen it for the first time. Namely, the fact that T doesn't contain a directed cycle implies that we can order the players in the tournament in the following way. So we write them as P1, P2 up to P capital N in such a way that if I is less than J, then PJ doesn't win against pi so basically p1 wins or draws all of his matches p2 loses at most to p1 and so on as a quick intuition this looks like it might already be the ordering of the players corresponding to this descending score sequence now we haven't proven this implication so far so let's go ahead and do this notice that it will be enough to prove that we can find a player p1 who doesn't lose because then we can just delete P1 from T and get a new tournament that also doesn't contain any directed cycle. Then we can reapply this to get P2 and so on. So let us assume otherwise. In other words, we assume that for any player P, we can find a player Q of P such that P loses to Q of P. Hence, if we pick a player P, then we have that P loses to Q of P, loses to Q of Q of P, and so on. Since this sequence continues infinitely long, it must at some point return to some player. And now let Q be the first player that appears twice within this sequence. This is a directed cycle of length at least three which contradicts our assumption and therefore we have proven this claim. Now I will draw a new picture of T where we can directly label our vertices like this. So we have P1, 
P2, and so on up to Pn. Since our ordering has this nice property, we only have to draw in edges for every draw, because by this, the outcomes of all other games are already determined. This undirected graph will be a forest, because we recall that T also doesn't contain an undirected cycle Cn. To finish, we could try to prove that all of these graphs are possible, and then just count the number of such forests. For me, trying to prove this was very difficult, and I hope it is also for you, because it is false. At some point, this should motivate us to look for other sub-tournaments that T can't contain, and that's what we're going to do now. Let's start with considering tournaments on just three vertices. If we want this tournament to yield the same score sequence as another one on three vertices, we can't have anybody getting four points, because this already determines these two edges, and then the last one is also determined. In the same way, nobody can lose both his matches, and so let's now consider all other complete tournaments on three vertices. We have already dealt with the cases C3 and D3, and therefore these tournaments are the only possible ones remaining. Indeed, these two tournaments are distinct, but have the same score sequences, and therefore T can't contain either of them. We call those tournaments A and B, and I just noted down that T doesn't contain A or B. Now, looking at the structure of these tournaments, we particularly notice that in B, we have this vertex having two draws. If a player draws at least twice, we can look at the outcome of a match between two such opponents. Since T doesn't contain a C3 or B, all possible outcomes here are impossible. And therefore, T doesn't contain a vertex that draws at least twice. Let's use this new knowledge to draw a new possible picture for T. So this graph is now a matching, which precisely means that any vertex has degree at most one. Now we take a look at A. And notice that this tells us that even this is not a possible choice for T, because we really have those edges in our tournament, or yeah, P1 wins against P2, P2 wins against P3, which gives us precisely A as a subgraph here. Therefore, we can have draws at most between players Pi and Pi plus 1. This restricts our possible choices for this graph by a large number. Since any player draws at most once, we can deduce that Pi will have score 2 times n minus i plus an epsilon which is an absolute value less than or equal to 1, depending on whether or not Pi draws, and whether this draw will be with a player above or below him in the ordering. These numbers will decrease monotonically as we increase the player index i, and therefore this is indeed equal to the score Ai. All these graphs give us unique and pairwise distinct score sequences Ai. If we can prove that any such score sequence determines the graph t uniquely, then it would follow that f of n also counts the number of graphs t such that all properties on the right hold. We will now prove by induction on the number of players that ii determines t uniquely. Notice that the player 1 can win at most all of his games, and therefore a1 is less than or equal to 2 times n minus 1, which is our first case. And then for p1, we only have one second case where he draws against p2, and a1 will be equal to 2 times n minus 1 minus 1. In the first case, p1 beats p2, and we are done by induction on the remaining vertices starting at p2. Otherwise, p2 and p1 draw, and moreover, we have that p2 also has score a2 equals a1. And then p1 and p2 beat all of the other players, and we are again done by induction on the players starting with p3. I should note that this is only true when n is greater than or equal to 2, but for n equals 0 or 1, the statement is clear, and this also gives us our base case, and therefore this implication is proven. It remains to count this number of graphs t, which can be done by the same induction. Namely, we have f of 0 equals f of 1 is equal to 1, and our two cases give us an f of n minus 1 and f of n minus 2 respectively, which implies that f of n 
is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Combining this with our two initial values for f, we can conclude that f of n is just the nth Fibonacci number f n. So the answer to our original question is just fn and therefore we are done.